Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. My name is Lauren Bryant and I'm the project manager for Boston Parks for the Franklin Park Action Plan. As people are arriving, we want to take this opportunity to share a quick reminder for using Zoom. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there's a button labeled chat. If you click this, you'll be able to send a chat to the project team. People with the blue backgrounds, uh, Franklin Park backgrounds behind them are members of this project team, and we're both from the design team and from the city. We'll also use the toolbar later when we go into virtual small discussions. Also wanted to make sure that people noticed the button at the bottom for their video. So feel free to turn it on or off um, during the presentation, but we'd love it if people are willing to turn it on during the breakout rooms later so we can have more of a conversation. If you experience any Zoom related issues, please send a chat to Christine Brandeo with the City of Boston. And for anyone who's calling in, you don't have the ability to use the chat box. So for all of the callers, please use star nine to raise your hand to be able to ask a question. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions or comments, please take note of them and share them during the breakout room sessions. And for those of you that are on the phone, you can text your questions to 617. 590-2383. This meeting is being recorded and will be available on the project website, franklinparkactionplan.com by the end of the week. And lastly, before we get into the meeting content, please note that interpretation was not requested for this meeting. So this meeting will be in English. However, for future City of Boston meetings, please know that we're eager to hear all voices and are able to offer translation and interpretation as requested. So please reach out to me or whomever is hosting those meetings and we can make sure that we can get that set up for you. We're also going to post in the chat both my email address, lauren.bryant at boston.gov and that project website, franklinparkactionplan.com. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ryan Woods, who is the commissioner of the Parks Department to say a few words. Um. We're after 12, right? So good afternoon, everybody. Um, for the past uh, two and a half years, we've been working with the community to understand how the city can do a better job um, stewarding this premier park, uh, Franklin Park, all 520 acres of it. So we thank you for being along on this journey. This park is a loved part of many people's daily routines, whether it's walking, respite, recreation, um, and a place that people host these treasured events. So from the allocation of $28 million from Franklin Park from the city sale of Winthrop Square, Barrage uh, sparked the Franklin Park action plan process and it provided us funding for permanent maintenance and programming endowment for the park, as well as funding to help realize uh, plan recommendations. So while $28 million may seem like a lot of money as it is, uh, it's certainly not enough to fund all the work that 520 acres of this parkland needs. So we need to be thoughtful and strategic in how we leverage these funds to maximize their input, impact, and make the most of this opportunity. We also need to be investing in park operations to sustain the improvements we make. It can't just all be about capital work. It has to be about the maintenance of that work. The Franklin Park Action Plan has been a process of building community connections, which have informed a set of recommendations that will help us all envision how our aspirations for Franklin Park can be realized. We've heard from many of you about the ways in which Franklin Park is treasured for what it already is, and it's our job to protect and restore the elements in the park that are in need of renewed stewardship. We've also heard from many of you about ways in which Franklin Park is underperforming, falling short of what it can be as a resource to the community, if only the infrastructure in the park better supported the kinds of uses and activities people seek to do there. This plan will guide our work for years to come. It's not just about adding facilities, but about celebrating what we have, developing processes to care for the landscape and park features, and making people feel welcome, exploring and enjoying the park. We view the action plan process as a foundation on which to build future design work, all of which will have us reconnecting with neighbors and park users to consider projects in greater detail. Everything that the community has contributed to this plan is being synthesized by the design team and will be folded into the final plan document to be released for public comment, uh, hopefully late summer uh, to early fall. So today's meeting and discussion will help us understand what the community wants to see happen first. Thank you for investing this effort with us and for your time today. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to the team. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. 
We're glad to see everyone here. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, you may have learned about this event by receiving a postcard or seeing a sign in the park um, through our project partners, the Franklin Park Coalition and the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, or by staying in touch on our website, social media and emails. Um, I think, if, there we go, thank you. Um, for those of you who are on the phone or want to review the presentation afterwards, the presentation and video of this meeting will be available for download on the website in the next couple of days. Or you can request a printed copy of the presentation by emailing me. Um, we'll share a summary of what we heard on the website as well. Um, we'll add both the project website, uh, franklinparkactionplan.com and my email address, lauren.bryant at boston.gov to the chat again for those who need them and may not have um, seen them earlier. So let's start with a quick overview of the agenda for today's meeting. Liza Meyer and I will provide a quick recap of Boston Park's catch-up meeting that was held on April 28th to provide some important context for the purpose of the workshop today. Then the design team will walk you through a short presentation to remind everyone of the high-level recommendations included as part of the action plan that are being considered for implementation. The presentation will be followed by small group discussions um, using, using virtual breakout rooms. We know that there are going to be questions about project costs, timeline, and phasing, and we'll share some high-level information on that and examples throughout the presentation. Because we have a short amount of time together today, we really want to focus the breakout room discussions on understanding your priorities so that when we leave today's conversation, we'll have a clearer understanding of what's most important to the community as we move forward. At the end, we'll come back together and discuss next steps and how to stay involved um, with the process going forward. And before we dive in, I also want to do an introduction of Chief White Hammond. Um, Chief, would you like to share anything with us? There we go. Hi, I just wanted to say hello. Um, you might, for those of you who know me, this is not how my voice usually sounds. I'm not doing well today, so I am not gonna be able to stay the whole time. But I wanted to at least um, let you know it had been my intention to be here. Um, I'm really thankful that you um, made it out today to um, be with us. So thank, thank you for your time and engagement. And um, I look forward to hearing an update on what um, comes out of this space. Thank you, Chief. I hope you feel better. Um, we'd like to remind everybody that while we're thinking holistically about the park through all of the action plans recommendations, that we need to be mindful that there are particular areas that are outside of the action plan scope shown in gray. Um, just because these areas are technically outside of the project scope doesn't mean we aren't carefully thinking about how access and these adjacencies are addressed. Gray areas that are also striped with pink um, are locations that are that the action plan will provide recommendations for the edge conditions. And then there are also areas that are in light pink, and those will require future coordination with park and city stakeholders in order to implement those recommendations. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liza, who's going to do a brief recap of our catch up meeting from a couple weeks ago. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, just quick introduction. I am Liza Meyer, Chief Landscape Architect with Boston Parks, um, and it's nice to be here with everybody again. Um, so a couple weeks ago, April 28th, we kicked off the implementation phase of the action plan um, with a catch up meeting that was led by the city. Um, the design team was there as well and a good number of um, people attended. So we hope it was a productive night. Um, if you weren't able to attend, I'll just give a really quick overview of what some of the information we covered, but um, the full recording of the meeting and the presentation slides are available on the project website. So you can go take a look there. Um, the first thing you did was look back at the project process and schedule, which is what's shown here, um, including the next steps of the remaining phase of work to get to the end of the project. So today and tonight, since we have another meeting this evening, are not our final community, they are our final community workshops, but they're not our um, last chance to hear from people um, related to improvements at the park. After gathering all the input we receive at this meeting, um, the design team will be finalizing the action plan this summer, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, and then the plan will be publicly released at the end of summer or early fall with a comment period following the release. 
all the comments that we that are collected during that comment period will serve as important input for our next steps towards implementation. So we'll hold all of those and use those to inform um, design phases moving forward. And as we start to implement the plans recommendations, there will also be future engagement processes associated with the detailed designs of each of those projects. Um, so one of the things that we've heard along the way is that it's hard to, for people to understand how we go from plan recommendations to build projects. And so this diagram provides a way of sort of talking through that. Um, it's a bit convoluted, but I think that's appropriate because sometimes the process in its iterative nature can be, um, can seem a bit convoluted, but um, let me walk through it quickly. So action plan recommendations um, will inform the scope of a potential project. So BPRD will begin with that scope and a general project cost, which is also informed by the plan, and we'll work with the budget office to determine a funding strategy. From there, we'll hire a designer who will develop the design with more detailed studies, including considerations of you know, deeper site analysis, grading, utilities, ecology, maintenance, historic significance, all of these things that need to be factored into design. And that design process will also include community input and collaboration with park stakeholders and other city departments as part of each project. Um, almost all the work we do in Franklin Park uh, requires Boston Landmarks Commission review, and some projects will also require review and approval by the Conservation Commission. So this design process may result in refinement of the initial project scope or the funding strategy. Um, and so we may end up sort of circling back and refining those things, but before we get to a final design plan, which we can then bid, build, and maintain. So I wanna just touch a little bit on project funding. This funding is a key factor that facilitates moving from an idea to reality. So as the commissioner mentioned, the city has already committed 28 million for improvements at Franklin Park from the sale of the Winter Square Garage. And of that, 5 million has gone into an endowment fund for ongoing maintenance and park activation. The remaining 23 million is to be used towards park improvements, um, but we'll also be seeking funding through our annual capital budget, which we did this year, and, and funding for um, Franklin Park projects are included in the mayor's FY23 recommended budget. So we hope to be able to see those, some of that work move forward. Um, what the Winter Square funds afford is the opportunity to jumpstart projects that wouldn't typically fall within our cyclical park renovation work. So that means investing in spaces that need more than just an upgrade or a rehab. I think it's important to note that the sum total costs of all of the potential projects coming out of the action plan will total close to 175 or 200 million. So this is not just a look at how do we spend 23 million. This is thinking about strategically, how do we approach all of this work that we'd like to see happen at Franklin Park over a time horizon of 25, 30 years um, so that we can see these recommendations come to life. So we'll be approaching this work incrementally. Um, and we know that some things will change as we move forward, but that's fine. That's, that's what happens over the lifespan of a property. Um, but what we're interested in understanding today is what your key priorities are so that we can work moving forward on implementing uh, the right things first. So just a little bit more on capital funding versus maintenance funding. So the Winthrop Square funds are one of several different funding types that we have. Um, most park work is funded through capital dollars, which is what's listed here on the left side. And you can see some of the project types that we typically seek capital resources for. Um, occasionally projects are supplemented by state grants or other um, outside funds like development mitigation or private donations. And then here we'll also have the Winthrop Square funding, which is a unique opportunity at the park. And then in terms of maintenance funding, um, improvements and maintenance work go hand in hand. And we're aware that maintenance in Franklin Park is of major importance to the community. The action plan will include maintenance recommendations. And um, 
we'll be looking at how we can expand our, our existing staffing capacities to address maintenance needs, both existing maintenance needs and projected maintenance needs as um, plan improvements come into play. So, and we'll also be continuing to collaborate with our park partners at the Franklin Park Coalition and the ENC to stay informed about community maintenance priorities. So most maintenance work is funded through the city's annual operating budget. And that includes all the costs related to staff, materials and equipment. And then the 5 million from Winthrop Square that went into the endowment to fund the Franklin Park Trust now provides us with additional maintenance funds and operating funds for programming that we haven't had before. And Lauren will touch a little bit more on that um, in a minute. And then maintenance work is also supplemented by volunteer hours where possible. And lastly, the city's new power, pro or power core program um, will give us even more capacity to address some of our currently unfunded needs and unmet needs in the park system. So I'm gonna pass it back to Lauren to um, from here. Thanks, Liza. Um, so one of the things we wanted to share with you guys as well is not only talking about the recommendations that are coming out of the master plan, but how a lot of our community conversations over the last few years have already gotten the ball rolling with us on some other items that we're saying, calling items in motion. Um, so we're excited to share with you that we've already got a lot of things that have been happening, um, including um, some items through the various funding sources that Liza had mentioned, um, which include Mayor Wu's proposed FY23 budget. And some of those items in that budget are park improvements, specific early improvements for the Bears, Bear Dens and White Stadium, also some targeted maintenance and repair work, and also management, which includes coordination and collaboration with our various stakeholders and partners. And we're excited to keep these items moving and get more items in the works in the short term. Another item on the management side that we've heard much community support for is on the topic of equitable investment through the implementation of the action plan recommendations. Um, we have two updates that have positive impacts on this goal. The first is regarding workforce development opportunities through the Power Core program that Liza just mentioned. This is a new city program which is expected to launch this spring and it's a workforce development initiative that will expand access to green jobs through paid, paid training and hands-on work. Um, it'll focus on things like tree care, urban wilds maintenance, and park rangers work. The other initiative is related to equitable procurement of contracted work. So the city's Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion is focused on economic equality through a number of different programs and initiatives, including those that are dedicated to bringing more contracts to both local um, minority and women-owned businesses. Um, the Boston Parks Department is going to be able to support those policies and programs through contracted work at Franklin Park, just as we did with the pilot equitable procurement project we undertook this past year. Um, we're excited to be able to further the goal of ensuring that the surrounding community is impacted in a positive way by the investments in Franklin Park. Which brings us to where we are now. Um, so we've spent the earlier phases of the project understanding the park and developing recommendations with the design team, um, guided by a series of conversations and surveys with the community of park users and neighbors. As we transition into talking about community priorities for implementation, we want to spend some time reminding you that the recommendations, sorry, well, what the recommendations are and sharing the priorities that have risen to the top so far. Our team's been developing project costs along the way, and we'll share some of those examples today. Um, but in this phase of the action plan, we want to focus on your priorities for investment so that as we move into the next steps of securing the appropriate funding streams that we're targeting what's most important to you all first. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bree from Agency Landscape and Planning, um, and she'll talk more about how engagement is informing these last phases of the plan. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Bree Henseld with Agency and the design team here led by Reed Hildebrand. 
Thousands of voices have continued to contribute to the action plan, helping us all to understand what you love, um, what needs improvements, and where the key oppor opportunities lie. Um, we've heard these ideas through the community workshops, surveys, as well as the continued meetings with groups around the park over the last summer and fall. And we've heard a lot from those meetings, which has driven the recommendation, uh, the development of the plan recommendations. Your feedback also informed the creation of uh, the action plans for big ideas, which structure the design recommendations for the park that we'll talk about today. We've used this framework to ensure all, that all of the projects you see today incorporate your vision for the future of Franklin Park, um, to amplify magnets with programs and improvements that accommodate your needs, as we heard them, to clarify how you move through the park, to activate the park's edges, and to increase access and better connect the park to the communities that surround it. Underlying all of these ideas is the need to unify the park's landscape to make it a stronger and more resilient natural resource, recreational destination, and a place where the community can come together. Out of the feedback from workshop three, out from the design survey, and from recent city-led conversations, you share that your top priority for the action plan is really to incorporate basic needs like restrooms, lighting, water fountains, and directional and, and informational signs throughout the park. Investments in the Alma Lewis Playhouse and the reestablishment of Circuit Loop as a safe and continuous bike and pedestrian loop throughout the park and management of the, of the park's diverse landscapes and ecologies were also top priorities that we've heard a lot about. As Liza mentioned earlier, we know that park maintenance is on everyone's minds and any new project in the park is going to plan ahead for how, how it will be maintained once it's built but there's also existing maintenance priorities that need to be addressed sooner and through increased staffing capacity. So these immediate needs have been hi highlighted through the Franklin Park Coalition's recent maintenance survey results, um, which you can see on this slide outlined at a high level um, and also at some detail. Um, as you can see, some items are easier to tackle immediately and others will take some coordination and planning, but are still within reach. Um, so this, this project is thinking about how do we address both of those timeframes. The overarching priorities we've heard from the community so far fall, can fall into these three primary project types. Ma maintenance projects are the first and they include many of the projects shared uh, by the Franklin Park Coalition in that previous slide. They tend to be more immediate in nature and will be focused on specific issues facing the park and its users today. Ecological restoration projects, which might include things like invasive plant, re uh, plant removal, will require a strategic and sustained plan for longer term reinvestment. And then there's capital projects. So these might be what you think of as more typical park improvements. They're discrete one-time projects like restoring the Overlook Ruins, that when completed will have an immediate positive impact on the park and its use. And today we'll be focusing on projects um, within both the ecological restoration and capital projects categories. So funding to support these projects is a big part of implementation like Liza and Lauren both shared. And as you can see here, there's a whole range of costs associated with the many different action plan recommendations within the plan. There are small and large capital improvements, um, like a, for example, Nature Play or the Alma Lewis Playhouse project at the Overlook. Um, then there's ecological restoration of the wilderness, which would be a multi-year investment and a restoration process that will have to be guided by a more comprehensive park woodlands management plan. And then there's general maintenance efforts, which will grow over time. And the rate of that growth is somewhat dependent on uh, how the capital improvements are made in the park over time as well. So we're providing on the slide these examples of cost for a range of project types to give you a sense of what might be expected. We don't today wanna to focus on the individual price tag of each project that we'll take a look at. Rather, we wanna understand your top priorities so that the city can focus their efforts in the near term to secure the appropriate funding for the projects that you'd like to see happen first. And no matter the project type or cost, there's a lot of additional factors that will need to be considered as any, as any project moves forward into implementation. Projects will range in size and location within the park. Some projects will have varying timelines and many of the projects will require multiple funding sources to implement and maintain for years to come. We also have to think about permitting and logistics and often we'll have to coordinate or collaborate with other city agencies and stakeholders as needed. Franklin Park is also a designated Boston landmark and most improvements will have to undergo the commission's review for approval. 
And there's also priorities around bringing a positive impact to the park's ecology and surrounding communities. So any, any projects that move forward will have to take uh, into account a lot of these different kind of layers of logistics and coordination. And now I'll pass it to Kristen Fredrickson and Lydia Cook from Reed Hildebrand. And they're gonna take us on a virtual walk around the park to remind everyone of the plans list of top projects. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Kristen Fredrickson from Reed Hildebrand. And as Bree said, with agency and mass design, um, together we make up the design team. Um, so we'd like to now take you through a quick virtual walk around the park to remind you of the action plan's recommendations. To facilitate conversation, we've broken the park into four zones, the Playstead and Long Crouch Woods, Peabody Circle and the American Legion Edge, Ellicott Dale in the Wilderness, and Circuit Drive and Circuit Loop. For each of these zones, we'll show you an overview plan that identifies the recommended improvements at a high level. We'll also describe a feature project in a bit more detail. Each feature project represents your feedback on priority investments from workshop three and the continued conversations that happened over the last summer. Our breakout room discussions will also be organized by these four zones. You can choose which area you'd like to join first and we'll also be able to move between rooms to join different conversations. Before we dig into the individual projects, we wanna take a moment to highlight key design components that are part of the thinking behind any capital improvement in the park. Things like signage, furnishings, lighting, pathways, drainage, and planting are fundamental components that improve access, safety, ecological function, and comfort for everyone who visits Franklin Park. Please know that even if they're not highlighted in our review today, these essential elements are part of the plan's proposals. Now let's take a virtual walk around, starting with the Playstead and Long Crouch Woods. As you may remember from our last workshop, the vision for the Playstead is to renew this well-loved space to work better for all of its many different uses, sports, spectating, tailgating, education, large events, and more. Projects include better integrating White Stadium by opening up access for shared use for Boston Public Schools and the community, upgrading the athletic fields with improved soils, drainage, and stormwater management to increase their durability, and the creation of a planted embankment that brings you up to the tailgate edge, a shaded space for barbecuing, watching sports, and gathering with friends and family. We are proposing a permanent home for the beloved Elma Lewis Playhouse in its historic location at the Overlook. A new stage and seating for outdoor performances would be supported by a pavilion building with restrooms, vending space, and storage. This work would respect the historic nature of the site by restoring and stabilizing the original masonry walls, steps, and furnishings. Removal of the overgrown vegetation and invasive plants will improve views and connection to the fields below. All of the improvements are linked by a continuous playstead loop, a one mile bike and pedestrian path supported by lighting, seating, and tree planting. There's even potential for a dog park along the loop. In Long Crouch Woods, an improved path network weaves through a series of outdoor rooms and new nature play areas geared toward a range of ages. A reimagined bear dens are restored to preserve the unique historic elements that characterize this park feature while integrating new uses like splash pads and flexible areas for community programming and events. As with much of the park's woodlands, enjoyment of Long Crouch Woods must be supported by investing in the health of this landscape including managing invasive species and regenerating the forest canopy. Now let's move to Peabody Circle, the American Legion Edge and Scarborough Pond. Peabody Circle, which is the park's main entrance is transformed from a place for cars to the neighborhood's front porch and a true gateway to Franklin Park and the zoo. We love the idea that a place which is car oriented today could become a welcoming entrance to the park that opens onto Blue Hill Avenue. An outdoor amphitheater shaded by new canopy trees serves multiple purposes, an education space shared with the zoo, an area for gatherings and events, or a shady space to eat lunch on a weekday. At the center of it all, the historic circle is represented in paving to create a flexible plaza that can host markets, food trucks, or small events. This work will require coordination with BTD to clarify and simplify the ways that cars can circulate through the space today and with the zoo to support their main entrance and visitors. As we move past Peabody Circle, the circuit loop connects you to several critical forest ecologies, Abbotswood, Rock Morton and Milton, and Scarborough Hill. 
all need to be reinvigorated with invasive species removal and improved ecological diversity through native planting. New and improved trails and selective clearing of overgrown vegetation provides views across the park from high points. Care of the park's oldest and largest heritage trees, many of which are located along the existing circuit loop, must also be elevated as a priority to preserve them for years to come. Scarborough Pond's aquatic ecology must be protected from nutrient-rich runoff and supported by additional planting at the water's edge. The maintenance yard is an important anchor on this side of the park, servicing the management and care of all of Boston parks from this location. Future improvements to the yard are imagined to support both BPRD and community uses within the space, including potential spaces for workforce and volunteer training. And now Lydia will take us through the last two zones of improved, uh, sorry, excuse me, proposed improvements. Thanks, Kristen. Let's make our way over to Ellicott Dale, also known as the Shattuck Picnic Grounds and the Wilderness. Ellicott Dale is imagined to be a destination for everyday life, from birthday parties or family gatherings to movie nights and more informal games and recreation. As an everyday destination, an active edge along the parking area and the upper lawn will include a new shade structure and restrooms, as well as expanded tennis courts. As you transition down the slope, the lower lawn is restored as a flexible space just to be, an idea closer to the historic intent and that meets the community's aspirations around what makes Franklin Park unique. Buffer planting at the lawn's edge will increase habitat value and add seasonal layers of vegetation to the park that are missing today. A woodland, boardwalk, and trails bring people into unique natural areas nearby, and a flowering tree walk leads visitors over to Schoolmaster Hill where the historic ruins and pergola are restored. As we transition to the wilderness, we move through the restored Ellicott Arch, a new, with new lighting that makes this a safe connection in the evenings and early mornings. The wilderness is also one of the primary places that we've heard is critical to emphasize ecological restoration and management. Invasive removal of this space is the first step in this process, but must be supplemented by seeding and planting of native, native and evergreen species to support habitat diversity. Managing the trail network is also a key factor in controlling the spread of invasive plants. This will require decommissioning redundant paths and clarifying circulation with trail wayfinding. This should be guided by a woodlands management plan and will be su a sustained effort over several years to complete. Lastly, let's look at the circuit loop and circuit drive, which is central to how we can think about clarifying movement through the park of any kind. We want to elevate multimodal routes for bikes and pedestrians, connect visitors to major park destinations, improve parking and vehicular and bus circulation, and recommend strategic improvements at the park's edges to provide ADA access to the park's major loops. A reestablished circuit loop as a pedestrian and bike path is supported by consistent lighting and signage, directing visitors to various park destinations along its length. The loop also creates better and more frequent path connections to the wilderness from the south and improves woodland habitat. Cars and buses are still important ways that people access the park today, and we want to better support those modes of travel and improve the character of the park's main road, Circuit Drive, which is reimagined as a parkway supported by canopy trees, appropriate lighting and signage, safe pedestrian pathways and crossings, and drainage solutions that address the flooding issues that we see along the road today. The proposals around the circuit loop and circuit drive are complex, but we believe that these are worth exploring. The improvements are likely to be considered in phases and must be supported through careful testing and traffic feasibility studies in collaboration with the Boston Transportation Department and other park partners, and will continue to be informed by ongoing community feedback. Lastly, let's touch on the parking at the Sausage Lot, which is along the north side of Circuit Drive between the zoo and the golf course, where canopy trees will also play an important role in embedding improved and expanded parking into the landscape of the park. This parking lot will also play a critical role in managing stormwater, in addition to supporting the many visitors who begin their park experience here. 
Now I'll turn it back over to Liza and Bree, who will get us set up to move into the breakout room discussions. When, is Liza with us? Did she drop off? I think she was having some computer problems, but I thought she was back. I think um, maybe I can take us right into Not the back, breakout yeah. rooms. That sounds One good. One second. Okay, terrific. All right. Well, thank you for being with us, uh, being here with us. We know that was a lot of information we just shared with you. Um, and we're excited to hear from you in just a moment as we head into the breakout sessions where you, you'll be joined by members of both the design team and BPRD. Um, as a reminder, this phase of the action plan is really focused on prioritization. So we're interested to hear which projects are your top priorities and why, um, and how that might inform uh, timelines and what happens next. We're also ready to answer additional questions that you might have about the implementation process. So before we jump into the breakout rooms, please just take, a, take note of a few ground rules to keep the conversations positive and productive. We, we hope everyone can be present in the session as much as possible. So if you wouldn't mind keeping your videos on, if you're in a place where you feel comfortable doing that, that'll help conversation. This is a space for respectful conversation. So you're all welcome to disagree with us or with what you hear um, and everyone's ideas are welcome, but please stay focused on the topics and try to build on what others have said. Um, share the mic too. So we wanna keep in mind that lots of people have joined us today and we wanna give everyone who wants it a chance to speak and the opportunity to contribute. So thank you for uh, taking that in mind. Um, all right, as we head in, you should see a pop-up uh, pop window Sorry, I'm getting invited already. Uh, you are too, hang with me for one more minute. Um, you should see a pop-up window right now from which you'll be able to select which room you'd like to visit. And you can either click to enter the room or leave the pop-up alone and it'll take you to a discussion room automatically. So don't worry if you uh, don't click. If you'd like to visit multiple rooms, you can choose to move around at any time two different ways. The first is to click breakout rooms in your Zoom meeting toolbar, which is typically at the bottom of your screen. And this will display the list of different breakout rooms again that you can join. So you'll cl click the breakout room that you wish to participate in and then click join to move. You can also click leave the room to return to the main session and Christine will work to get you into the breakout room that you wanna go to. If you wanna visit all four zones, that would be great. Um, and you should plan to move be between rooms about every 10 minutes. We'll be giving time updates every 10 minutes to each room um, so people know if they wanna keep moving. When we come back together, there'll be a chance to share summaries of the discussions, and we'll see you in about 40 minutes. Thanks, everyone. If you're having trouble seeing the rooms, um, you can scroll down on the right hand side of the window and there you should be able to see Circuit Drive, Playstead, Ellicott Dale and Southeast and you can just click that you want to move there or you can click join. Do you guys need help picking a room? Janine, which room do you want to be in? Ellicott Dale, sorry. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, I'm not able to pick a room either. All right, give me one second. I think it's because I'm on my phone. It might be, but I'm not too sure. It's not letting me, hold on, I found it, here we go. Um. Janine, what's Alex Scott do? Laquisha, uh, it says Laquisha, but <laughs> um, which one do you want to be under? You just said um, you are on your phone. Majority, do you want to be in a room? Anyone else want to be in a particular room? It's no choice on my screen. Okay, so you have Circuit Drive, um, Playstead, um, Ellie Co Cockdale, and the Southeast and Peabody Yard. Well, I want to pick number two, but there's no play way to do it on my screen. I can put you in there. Yeah, but why don't you have the, the, the choices on the screen? It's supposed to. I'm not sure why on your side it's not giving you that option okay well put me in number two please okay i'd also like to be in number two okay no problem jan karen um i think i am going to not go into a room just like work <laughs> while you guys are all there okay that's uh, fine is uh is lauren is lauren uh, lauren bryant um uh, working this week because I called her voicemail and it said it wasn't, but I saw her there and I needed to reach her about a meeting. Do you have? Yeah, idea? she is working. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Um, maybe she's a little backed up. I'm not too sure. Okay. Jan, do you want to be in a room? You can actually, why don't you put me in, um, what were the four options again? Circuit Drive, Playstead, um, Ellis, uh, Ellicott Dale, and um, Peabody Yard. Why don't we do Peabody Yard? Okay. Thanks.
Everybody making their way? Okay, I think we're back. Um, I have faith in Zoom. So welcome back everyone. Um, really appreciate all the discussions that you had hopefully um, in each of the diff different rooms. And so as we wrap up, we're gonna ask the facilitators um, to just take a minute or two to share a couple of big takeaways that came out of the conversations in their zooms, in their in their Zoom rooms, in their zones, and we'll start with uh, the Circuit Drive team and John Kett. Great, thank you, Bree. Um, we had a great conversation in the Circuit Drive uh, room. Um, I would say we had a, a full spectrum of people who uh, were very strongly in support of of the proposal of along Circuit Drive. Uh, in particular, uh, as it came to safety and experience within the park, um, and also some sort of reality check questions about uh, increased frequency of access on the 16 bus line and some other, um, uh, you know, things that will have impacts to the to the feasibility of the proposal and how, because of that, things may get in incrementally implemented over time and how we can accomplish as much of the goals uh, of the overall closure uh, over time, if, if not able to get to that point. So it was a really great conversation. Excellent. Some of those ideas made their way into the other rooms, I think, too. Um, so we'll head over now to the Playstead. Chris Kroner. Hey, Bree. Yeah, this was a really terrific and very energized conversation that really uh, focused intently on the dog park conversation specifically and trying to figure out ways to get included. Um, the, the community members really want to try to be invited to the table to discuss everything from uh, the surfaces, the location, the equity of where they're located, if there could be a couple more of them, um, and how those could be maintained long term. And then that really spun off a couple of other conversations specifically about ecology and maintenance of the park itself and trying to create spaces um, also for benches um, and seating. And then we started discussing and going around the particular amenities, um, talking about um, the playhouse, the bear dens and, um, and the stadium and trying to understand, especially that there's um, opportunities for intergenerational uh, kind of mixes of people doing many different things in the same places and trying to really focus on um, opportunities for them to come together. Um, and we concluded on things uh, that we're trying to get walkability to splash pads, for example. Uh, Laquisa had a comment in the last group and I think she has her hand up also now if, if we had time to take it. Um, yes, how about we, Laquisa, I see your hand. Um, uh, two hands, both hands. And how about we just circle around the room and then we'll come right back to you if that's okay. Um, so we'll head to we'll head to Ellicott Dale for Kristen to report back on her room. Thanks guys. We also had a great conversation and spent a fair bit of time on, on circuit drive there as well because people feel super passionate about it. Um, some, you know, very strongly for some, um, some against or concerned about the kind of implications both for commuting and for just um, in park access that closure might create. Um, others really excited about the opportunity um, for int more fully integrating Ellicott Dale into the park with that kind of closure and reinforcing the intimacy of that space. Um, softball was similarly a little bit divided. Some people really wanting to um, keep it there, others recognizing that um, there aren't so many places in the park where you have an opportunity to more passively, um, to be in a kind of open lawn area without worrying about getting hit by a ball at the same time. So um, some advocates for this as being quite a special place within the park in terms of its intimacy and its ability to connect to so many different places and excited about the kind of connections that the plan is advocating for to the pond, to the wilderness, to Scarborough Hill and how that's supported by seasonal planting. Um, obviously the wilderness is something that people care deeply about and very interested in the um, restoration plans, questions about whether or not that will be guided by a um, careful and thorough woodland restoration plan. And um, we said that that was indeed the recommendation of the plan. Um, uh, very excited about 
tennis expanding, um, excited about opportunities for um, family gatherings to be invited more fully into this area, but recognition that, you know, if circuit drive closed or even without it, um, that this place, uh, when family gatherings, which can be quite large events happen, um, car access can sometimes overflow. And so wanting to make sure that any kind of change in uh, programming or encouragement to expand that kind of programming is thought about relative to that as well. Um, and then some questions about how connections from Forest Hills um, for bikes and pedestrians could be more fully executed on that, on that corner. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Um, lastly, we'll head to Peabody in the in the yard. Um, Lydia. Hey guys. Um, so this area is interesting because it is made up of um, kind of many different sides of the park. We started by focusing on a lot of the kind of ecologically based recommendations, um, which there were a lot of enthusiasm for in terms of restoration of Scarborough Pond and its ecologies. We talked about um, the heritage tree care and what would be involved in kind of um, partnering with other organizations to pursue that work. And we also uh, talked a bit about um, how you open up views and access to some of the woodlands, Abbotswood, Scarborough Hill, and Rock Milton and Morton, and the opportunities for kind of long views across the park and how you balance that with um, of ecological habitat priorities and things that are, are supporting particular species in that area. Um, and then there was also a lot of support for the proposals around Peabody Circle and recognition that that would really both serve um, a wide range of people that are using that as the park's main entrance, but it's also um, something that uh, the Blue Hill Ave um, side of the park and those neighbors can really claim as their own as well as that they don't really have um, kind of a, a close access to a, a open park space um, on that side today. Um, there were questions about how um, vehicular um, circulation and, and bus circulation would work in conjunction with that. And we also touched a bit on, on parking and how um, when that space is transformed, how the it's supported by the expanded parking in um, adjacent areas. Thank you. Lots of overlapping discussions and topics. Um, I wanted to acknowledge Laquisa, did you have a quick comment you wanted to add um, before we transition back? Um, okay, we'll keep going then, thank you. Um, and uh, people can continue definitely to putting to put things in the chat. We collect all that, and that's part of the feedback. Um, so before I hand things right back to Lauren, just want to thank everyone on behalf of the whole team for your continued participation throughout this process. Um, your input has really uh, formed the foundation of a really exciting set of ideas for the park. I think we heard that um, in the different rooms that some concerns, but people are overall really excited about what they're seeing and the possible changes. Um, and so I'll hand it over now to Lauren with some information on next steps. Thank you. And I know that we're at our time limit, so I want to be really respectful of your time. So I'll try to go through this really quickly. Um, could we jump back to the action plan slide really quickly? Or the, sorry, the open space slide, the one before this one. So just because we know you guys are all very um, interested in parks and open space, we want to make sure that you know that Boston Parks is updating our open space and recreation plan. And we're conducting a brief survey, which is going to close on May 31st. And you can access that survey via the website, boston.gov slash open dash space. Um, or you can use your camera on the QR code. And we'll also put the um, link in the chat for everyone, if you would be willing to take that for us. Um, and then on the next slide, just want to remind you that there are several ways to stay engaged or to get involved in this action plan process. Um, first, if you missed the catch up meeting that we talked about from April 28th, you can check that presentation and slides of the recording out on the project website under the resources tab. You can also view all of the past presentations um, and the recording of today's presentation will also be there in about a week. Um, so that link will also drop in the chat for you. And then a couple last things. Um, we just mentioned earlier that the action plan is set to be released summer or fall of this year with public comment period this fall. 
You can also sign up for um, adding your email address um, and sharing comments with us through the Franklin Park Action Plan website. And again, we can drop that link one last time for you. That project website is going to be live through the completion of the action plan. And then we're gonna work to migrate that back over to our own city of Boston website. The contact list that we have generated through that process will also migrate back over to the city of Boston. So not to worry, we'll still be able to keep you in touch for all of the future work that we're doing. Um, you can also reach out to me directly um, as the project manager, lauren.bryant at boston.gov. Um, and then that way you can send me an email. We can make sure you get added to my personal list as well as that main list serve. Also wanted to make sure everybody is aware that the Franklin Park Coalition is a fantastic resource. They provide wonderful programming and have volunteer opportunities. They're also a really great advocate um, and they help coordination between the community and the Boston Parks Department quite a bit. So you can check out their website as well, which is franklinparkcoalition.org. And then another resource, just one final one to make sure everybody knows is Boston 311. You can call them, you can use the app or visit the website. And it's a great way to let us know about needs in the park because you guys are out there all the time. So us knowing what you see is incredibly helpful. Um, so just wanted to say very last thing, thank you all again for your time today. It is very much appreciated. Please let people know if they weren't able to join us today that we're doing this again at 6.30 tonight. So let your friends and neighbors know if they weren't able to join us. And once again, thanks for all of your time. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.